see if I can get out of the light a little bit. It's blinding me. Good to be here with all of you and to see old friends. Some I've seen very recently and some I haven't seen in a while, Peter. Uh, and an honor to be asked to come and, and share a little bit with you all uh, this evening around the, the uh, topic that uh, Marie and I agreed on early in our conversations. I've worked uh, with uh, a number of groups across the country, church groups, trying to sort out a way for that church group to take on the doctrine of discovery and to uh, uh, you know, distance their denomination from discovery, including, uh, including Sisters of Loretto here in, in Colorado. The National Loretto's Movement on Discovery started here you know, with this group of Loretto's. It was interesting to see the resistance in different denominations to getting rid of this legal doctrine called, what, the doctrine of discovery, or as Steve Newcomb prefers to call it, the doctrine of Christian discovery, because it's an international law that says the first Christian people to discover a land that wasn't yet Christian gets to claim that land for their Christian prince. So it's actually a Christian law that has become American federal law. 1823, the Johnson v. McIntosh Supreme Court case <clears throat> with the majority decision written by the Chief Justice, uh, the unanimous decision, which clearly, clearly says it was okay for white European Christian people to come over and kill Indians and claim their land because, after all, they were Christian. And Indians were pagans and savages. Well, unfortunately, you know, it still has ramifications today. It didn't just go away. It is, as uh, Judge Kavanaugh might say, established law, right? It's established law. And indeed, if you look at your, the title of your home or your landlord's home if you're renting, right? Same difference. It's still Indian land. But go back and read the title and it will trace it back through all the previous owners one after another, after another, after another, until you get to the last line when it simply says, Indian claim quieted, or some such legal language like that. In other words, there were no owners before that. Just this ubiquitous native or Indian <laughs> so it was really important that we, you know, get people on board dealing with the doctrine of Christian discovery to get Christian denominations dealing with it. <clears throat> the World Council of Churches, National Council of Churches, and one denomination after another has taken a stand. I spent uh, last fall spent two days with uh, Disciples of Christ ministers in Washington State. Their uh, fall theology conference. Man, were they well read. Their denomination had taken a stand against discovery. 
but they were exceptionally well read and primed for me to come in and talk to them uh, about the problem. But they weren't ready for the question I asked them. Mm. The question is, what do we do now? Or, 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 or a corollary question. What difference does it make to Indian people? You all have refuted the doctrine of discovery. How much land did we get back? How was poverty alleviated at reservations like Wind River, Rosebud, Crow Creek, Pine Ridge? That's the post-colonial part of my query, Michael. Yeah, what do we do now at this late stage of colonialism to make right what was made wrong so long ago and made wrong generation after generation after generation from 1492 up until the present? Our resistance at Cannonball two winters ago was about discovery. It was about a lingering claim to Indian land right there. Indian land was flooded to make that lake. And nobody asked Cheyenne River or, 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 or uh, Standing Rock People, if they agreed to it, it was just a plan cooked up by the federal government and implemented by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And suddenly, people who lived 10 minutes away from their family had to drive an hour and a half around this huge lake in order to visit grandkids. Just almost overnight. But anyway, Indian people still live there. Both of those nations are right on the lake. Should they not have had a say to drilling an oil pipeline underneath the lake to transport oil, transport oil uh, uh, further south? That's basically what that was about. And we got creamed, right? It was in the news. We even had national news coverage. Uh, but eventually, we got creamed. And the oil is flowing today. And we lost that battle around the doctrine of discovery. Discovery was what was being invoked, whether it was said or not. This is federal land now. You, know, you have your reservation. You don't have any rights to this water that has now flooded what used to be your land. So what are we going to do? How are we going to, to change the game so that Indian people can actually get back into the game somehow on this continent and be part of the national discourse without doing what too many Indians have been forced to do for 500 years, just to abandon being Indian, abandon our cultures and our values and our way of seeing the world in order to buy into the Euro-Christian model, the Euro-Christian model in this case of, of, of capitalism eventually on this continent. Because, see, in our heart of hearts, we Indian people think we have something to offer the world. And yet it's getting late. It's going to be more and more difficult for us to really share the depth of what we have to share 
because it is so radically culturally different that people will either turn their nose up at it or cherry pick. Take a few things and wander off into the unset happy because you've respected Indian people and you now blow sweet grass in your church. That, that's not exactly what I have in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Bende Wajaji, I belong to the Osage Nation. Gromatonton, Bald Eagle Clan, the Hoka Division. That's a whole worldview in what I just said that I can't unpack. As Jill knows, w without a 10 week seminar, then we only scrape the surface of it a little bit. <coughs> it's a worldview predicated on harmony and balance, on, on, you know, paired opposites. Not oppositional dualism, but a but a reciprocal dualism, where you don't have a whole until you have both. So our village had two parts in the old days. To the north were the sky people, and to the south were the earth people. And you needed both sky and earth. You needed both male and female in order to have a whole. And it's important that I tell you that I'm part of Buffalo Clan, which is, uh, I'm sorry, a part of the Bald Eagle Clan, uh, which is Earth Division, because I've got a nine-year-old daughter who is a different clan than me. She's Buffalo Clan. And her clan is in the Sky Division. And it's important to the two of us as she grows up that she know who she is and I know who I am and we know who each other is and respect each other. Now, I can teach you to do this. But then you've got to learn what I taught my daughter when she first came to me. She was barely four years old, 50 months old. I said, sweetie, you don't know this, but you're Buffalo Clan. She's being raised by a, a white grandmother who wasn't raising her kids or her granddaughter to, to be Indian, uh, except in a new age sort of way. But her grandpa is an important Buffalo Clan leader. So I said, so you have to learn that when you put your shoes on, you have to start on the left side and put your left shoe on first. And then put your right shoe on. Now I'm Eagle Clan. I said, don't get confused by watching what I do. Because I put my right shoe on first because I come from the Honka. And then I put my left on. Simple, huh? You can learn to do this. But you have to know which division you are. And you don't even have a clan unless we make one up. And none of us picked our clans. We're born to a clan. Well, the right and left plays its way, plays itself out through the whole of the social structure of the old village. So much so that when the two different sides of the Osage went to bed at night, the Tsisho to the north, all of us with our heads to the east when we laid down, 
slept on their left shoulder. The Honka always slept on their right shoulder so that we were doing our part to hold the universe together in harmony and balance even through the night and that we were able to hold one another in a, a, a unified whole even though we're divided by a road that goes down the middle. But facing each other at night made us one people. Uh, for any academics in the room, it, it answers that fake French specialist, armchair anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss's query. How can a people be divided and united at the same time as French mind just couldn't wrap around it? Walk into the village. But then other anthropologists did walk into the village, they saw it in front of them and still missed it. Didn't understand what was at stake. And the truth is, We've now created a post-colonial world that is just disastrously out of balance. And no Osages trying to do it right can hold it together anymore. It's going to take more than Indian ceremony because you all outnumber us. <laughs> yeah, the last census, we were about 1% of the population, but we're not going away. We're going to be around to remind you and your descendants of these things, no matter how out of balance things continue to spin. By out of balance... I know we're all bemoaning the 2016 election and how crazy things are uh, under the leadership of an absolute white supremacist. But you've got to go back and think it through again in terms of what Hillary Clinton represented to some of us. She'd have signed off on that dapple uh, oil line, that tunnel under the lake, before Trump did. What I'm talking about getting back into balance isn't electing a Democrat this next time around. It's not finding just the right person to be president. Barack Obama was a good man. He hadn't been elected a full hour before he discovered that his hands were tied that he could not stand for the change we stand for, right? That that was campaign rhetoric, that the system would not allow him even to think about implementing once he was in office. So we got a bigger problem than Republican and Democratic politics here. We have a systemic post-colonial problem that goes back to the roots of colonialism and even before, but at least to the roots of colonialism and the doctrine of discovery. And we're going to have to be really creative and imaginative in order to change things around at this late date. Can we turn climate, uh, you know, the, the climate change catastrophe around in time? I don't know. I do know that doing that isn't in itself an answer because some of this other stuff will continue, that all these things are interconnected with one another, and we have to find a way to connect them before we can begin to pull them apart 
and make them right again. And it has to do with this business of how you see the world. What you're looking at when you get up in the morning and look in the mirror, or especially look out the window. What's there? It's one thing to feel really good when you're out of doors, right? To feel at one with nature. My mentor, who used to live around the corner here, used to tell his classes, yep, Euro Christians came out here. They saw the Rocky Mountains 200 years ago, 150 years ago. They stood in the mountains and said, my God, this is beautiful. We should pave it. <laughs> and essentially, it happened that way, didn't it? And we're going through it all over again in terms of the barriers, uh, wilderness, which is sacred to four or five, five different Indian nations down in that neck of the woods in, in uh, Arizona, uh, Utah, uh, New Mexico, the Four Corners area. In this case, electing the right person president may at least be a good strategy for at least winning that one little pawn, right? That one little piece on the chessboard. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I'm not saying we shouldn't put heart and soul into getting this jackass out of office and finding somebody who has some sanity to replace him. But all the forces of consumption, of extraction, are not going to go away. And those forces of consumption and extraction, they want to extract the minerals at whatever cost, are tied to a whole lot else in the systemic whole. It's tied to the war-making machinery of the United States and other nations to the military and dust, part of the military industrial complex. It's tied to banking. If you saw the list of banks that had uh, lent money to uh, Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, half a billion dollars each, and it was a long list of all the major banks, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, all of them. They were into it up to their necks. They had an invested interest in that pipeline being drilled under the lake, no matter what. They lost money if oil didn't start to flow pretty soon. So as we reimagine this new systemic hole, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to tell these people, these financiers, these generals, well, you just can't do that anymore. See, that's what I mean by a sea change, by a change in your world view. When we go out to do ceremony, we might in one ceremony particularly, pick a particular tree <coughs> that looks ideal for sustaining the hearts and minds of the people for four days and four nights through this ceremony. Uh, it's called in English a sun dance, but it's really about the tree, not the sun.
So we go out to that tree on the appointed day, the fourth day of the ceremony, actually. We talk to that tree. Some people shed tears at that tree as they explain to that tree why we need its life. Why we're cutting it down. This is just one tree. This isn't Georgia Pacific clear-cutting a whole blasted forest so that the silt can run into the rivers and kill all the spawning salmon. And, and you all know that story. One tree. And in order to take its life, we can't just cut it down. That would be murder. No, the only honorable way to do it, and this is part of our ceremony now, is to ceremonially make that tree an enemy. Make it an enemy. And, and you've got to understand a little bit more about our worldview because Indian war making isn't like Euro Christian war making. It's not a battle to the death to kill as many people as you can. No, it's a, it's a it's a contest in which the respect on both sides runs deep, so that we're. Constantly in our ceremony taking care of potential enemy warriors that might die in battle. We're ceremonially getting them ready from our side, not from theirs. They're doing the same thing from their side to make that journey into the Wanagi world. So when we go out to the tree, this is serious business. That's why people shed tears. We take a pipe to that tree and offer a pipe to that tree. Make other offerings of tobacco and other things. <coughs> Only then can we strike the first blow on that tree. And the first blow is always by a child. Originally, it was a young woman who had not reached the age of menstruation yet. More and more little boys are included in this too. But it was important that a child strike the first blow so that the tree knows this isn't done in anger. Then we can chop the tree down. Talking to the tree the whole time. Asking the tree to remember us and carry that memory of us and our needs into the Wanagi world. And then when it comes down, the people catch the tree. They don't even let it touch the ground. And it's not about the sacred. We don't have that word in Osage. The, so the holy? Oh, that, that, that's missionary language. They brought that from Europe and, and picked one of our words to mean that. That's part of decolonizing is taking apart the language so that we know Missionaries made this word mean God, this word mean sacred, this word mean pray. What did it originally mean to us? What does it mean today to native speakers? No, we catch that tree because it's a relative. A close relative. And carry it that way all the way to the Sundance Arbor and plant it in a hole that the men have dug to get it ready for the fifth day, which is the day, first day of dancing. I 
I assume that Euro Christians feel close to their pets and consider them a part of the family. We were going out to Tobol for ceremony a couple weeks ago. Early in the morning, came up from the south. I told my daughter, I said, where are your relatives? I don't see them. She said, yeah, they must still be sleeping. She knew immediately who I was talking about. Came up around the last hill and over a crest, and she said, there they are. That's the, the uh, Daniels Park buffalo herd. Those are her close relatives. And since she moved in, it's been six years, I have not cooked or served buffalo in my house. Because she can't eat it. It would be cannibalism. She'd be eating her close relatives. And out of respect, I promised her I would not do it. Now, when I'm out on my own, when I'm out with Jill, I can have a buffalo burger. <laughs> but, but I don't tell Dorothy, because those are her close relatives. She'd be hurt. That's what we mean by relatives. I tried to explain this to a group of Lutheran theologians because at one point in my life I still have some connection with uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Uh, Lutheran theologians stood up in the back and uh, said, Tink, what about tree slugs? I said, Paul, what do you have against tree slugs? Why would they not be considered relatives? They have their own life, their own spirit, their own energy, their own reason for being in the world. Why is that a problem for you? And he thought about it and sat down. He didn't pursue it any further. He was sure that I would share his abhorrence for tree slugs. But they all have their own reason for being in the world and we let them be until that mosquito bites me then he's attacked me in his fair game <laughs> uh, and my daughter had to learn when she moved in we're not afraid of spiders in my house and she now knows if she wants to get a spider, rid of a spider, she'll go find a cup and a paper plate to put over the top of the cup, capture the spider, and take her out into the bushes and let her go there. And I told her one time, I get in our Iongli, uh, Again, your Christians call it a sweat lodge, but Osages don't sweat, we perspire. <laughs> and the guy tending fire was smoking out the lodge before we went in. He said, Tink, there's a widow in there right there where you're going to sit. He said, let me go in and see if I can get her out. You know, black widow. So I said, go ahead. He went in and heard him for three or four minutes trying to track down that spider and finally came out and said, <coughs> she went under the wrappings right where you're going to sit. And I said, that's fine. We'll offer her some tobacco and ask her to leave us alone until we're done. And uh, you know what? <laughs> she left us alone. <laughs> Yeah, those are close relatives. Those are important relatives. So that when I talk about that phrase that we use, 
for all my relations. I'm talking about all of them, not just cousins, not just grandparents, not just members of my tribe, not just all of you, but the grass that's growing outside. That's a close relative. It's alive. The trees out there, uh, the squirrels and the sparrows, the robins, they're all relatives. And you've got to deal with them as if <coughs> they too have a right to the land, to inhabit the land. That's a different worldview. That's one that immediately sees harmony and balance as the prime quality. So that when we sing songs of harmony and balance, bringing in you know, all the Wanagi from the four directions, we're asking for balance in the whole universe. That dance around that tree is a dance for harmony and balance in the universe. It's a Cosmic renewal ceremony. It wants to renew the whole of the earth. We fear, of course, that its effects no longer radiate as far as it used to, but it still is strong within our communities. That's what it's going to take in this post-colonial period of late colonialism. Post-colonial doesn't mean colonialism's gone, by the way. Uh, post-colonialism starts on October 13th in 1492, the next day. So post-colonial is everything that's happened since and continues to happen. There is no way to move beyond colonization easily and simply. The British Empire thought if it gave flag freedom to all of their colonies, that suddenly they're not colonies anymore, that it's a post-colonial period, really. And of course it's not because they're still tied in to the same economic structures of oppression that they were before. It's just that they have something now called flag independence and are able to conduct their own elections. As, as, as Ward Churchill's wife, Natsu Saido, assured my class one day, never confuse elections with real democracy. Having the vote hasn't made us free. I mean, how many of us in this room would have chosen Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton as the two candidates to face off for leadership of the free world in 2016? How many of us would have picked John Kerry and George Bush no, to, to, to give me a right to choose between their two top guys or, in one case, a top woman? Ain't exactly what I have in mind by freedom and real democracy. We had that on this continent in every Indian community. And that's what the US government worked to destroy, was to destroy our structures of self-governance and replace it with, Osage has got a new constitution a dozen years ago. Brand new constitution. We now have an election where we elect a principal chief, an assistant principal chief, a national congress, 
and justices of the Supreme Court. What does that sound like? <laughs> have you had civics in high school? Have you heard this model before? I mean, it's unicameral, more like Nebraska than uh, any other state. But yes, we have been forced into adopting that Euro-Christian form of, of uh, pseudo-democracy. How are we going to create an imaginary that captures the imagination of people across the continent and begins to change hearts and minds so that they can look at climate change and say, <coughs> it's killing our relatives. It's not eventually going to kill us, it's already killing our relatives. Important living beings who are being killed off as we dam more and more rivers. Now in Bosnia, and continue other capricious habits of late, coloni late colonialist Euro-Christian democracy, and I call it Euro-Christian not to label it in terms of religious attachment, but, but that's the culture, the sociological culture of this beast that we're up against. And I suppose that means we have to question the role our churches have played and continue to play in maintaining this systemic whole. I want to stop and let you all engage me for a couple of minutes. Did I go, how long did I talk? Half hour? Hmm? 40 minutes, yeah. So I've got time to talk to you and get your words on the table. Yes, ma'am. Tell me your name. Um, I'm Colleen McBain. Hi, Colleen. And I want to thank you for sharing what you shared, which I already, I already know a great deal about um, Native American culture and have always loved it. And I wanted to share something that you may not know about. Um, I'm Irish, I'm Celtic, and in the Celtic tradition, um, there are many similarities with Native American uh, culture and traditions. And there is a person who died um, in 2008, his name was John O'Donohue. And in July of this year, he was honored um, in a worldwide conference that was held in Ireland, and I attended. Hmm. And what he taught was what you teach. And so I wanted to share this because his um, best-selling book, uh, New York Times uh, bestseller in 1998-99, uh, is being read in about 10 different languages all over the world. And so your philosophy and his philosophy is the same philosophy, and it is spreading out there, even though sometimes we become very depressed and sad because we think it's not there. It is growing uh, because of the work you're doing and the work that he has done through all of his books. And now I'm one of millions that is carrying that out too. So I hope that, that and at times I do get sad and, and grief, but we're not stomped out. And um, thank you for tonight to Donnie. remind me. Donnie, thank you. My, my bottom line on this continent is always going to be how much land do Indians get back. I, I'm not going to budge from that. It's about the land and everything that grows on the land. Uh, 
And if that's not on your agenda, uh, I'm afraid climate change is going to be a reality. You can't change climate change. You can't change the economy. You can't change any of the social justice issues you're interested in without taking care of America's hidden, secret sin of the murder of Indian people and the theft of our lands. And somehow there's got to be a benefit that comes back to us as we uh, dismiss the doctrine of discovery. Uh, it's still in U.S. law, though. How are you going to change that? How can you get the courts to reverse Johnson v. McIntosh? Plessy v. Ferguson was reversed, right? Johnson v. McIntosh is our Plessy case. It's never been reversed, and nobody can conceive of reversing Johnson. Thank you very much. Um, my understanding is that uh, there is this issue about Chief Seattle's letter that apparently uh, there's two uh, ideas that he didn't write it or he was concocted or that he did write it. But at any rate, the, the question resolves around ownership of land or anything else. Is it the case that the land belongs to the Indian nation and was taken away? Or is it the case that the land belongs to Great Spirit and that therefore we're allowed to use it without abusing it and without owning it. Great Spirit's another missionary device. We don't have a Great Spirit until the missionaries picked language that meant that and said, that's your word for God. So now on Indian Concern Sunday, all the major denominations of people are praying to Great Spirit and think they're respecting Indians. And they've even got us convinced that's us. That, but, but, but I can demonstrate that, that it's not a part of, uh, of who we are. Uh, the problem word here is ownership. That's another Euro-Christian colonial device. We didn't have that word. When we go into a, a ceremony like Iungli, this uh, sitting with the stones ceremony, the, the, the one that you all call sweat lodge. We're going in to suffer for all our relatives. You know, we, we are in there to feel the heat and it's unbearably hot for people who think it's kind of like a sauna. It's nothing like a sauna. It's much hotter and you stay for much longer then physicians will allow you to stay in a sauna. Uh, yeah, it takes a couple hours to do a Yungli ceremony, right? Uh, we're suffering, sacrificing, because as Indian P elders have always told us, this stuff in here, flesh and blood, that's the only thing I have that is actually mine. This fan belongs to the eagle that gave it up and from whom I have taken responsibility for. I don't own this fan. It lives with me. I feed it. I bring it with me whenever I talk in special events like this. So already we're in trouble talking about who really owns the land because Ownership is a Euro-Christian quotient. We knew what our territory was. Osages did. The Pawnees knew what theirs was. And the fact that we have buttered up against one another caused very little in the way of problems. Occasionally, there were little skirmishes to determine a new boundary of 
they started having more babies and they thought we were having less. They may want to move the boundary. Uh, but it's not about ownership, except when the first Europeans arrived, the Euro-Christians arrived. They wanted ownership. And they had, in fact, legal devices for claiming ownership. When uh, the Spanish arrived at Monterey Bay, in 1770, there's a ritual, and two people there wrote about it. One was the military commander who wrote about it in his report, and we have a parallel report written by the sacerdote, the Euro-Christian religious functionary in charge of claiming land for the Spanish monarchs, namely now Saint Junipero Serra, who was granted sainthood for his pains. And while ships offshore fired cannons to celebrate, he was on the beach with the whole army, governing officials, and all the priest missionaries doing the, his part in the legal proclaiming of this as Spanish land. This is claiming property, saying mass. And not the first time he said mass, under cover of cannons being fired from a ship off, off, offshore. Already in San Diego, that was his introduction to San Diego. So does that help? I believe so. Thank you. <laughs> and was a question here? Or? <coughs> well, I don't really know where to begin. Um, so I think I'll just ask if anybody wants to uh, form a little group to figure out how to overturn Johnson versus McIntosh, I'll chair the group. Um, I know that there have been partial solutions in other part of the world, but they always end up with giving Indians property, ownership. It's like, it must be so painful to have land that you have to accept ownership of, even at that. But at least you'd have land. And I'm thinking of New South Wales. Yeah, same story. Yeah. Same story in Australia. <clears throat> uh, if Johnson v. McIntosh is going to be overturned, I suppose you lawyers have to take care of that. <laughs> Two of them right here. <laughs> So I, I appreciate that uh, the word sacred and the word God don't exist in, in your tradition. Yeah. Can you help me understand how you, how you language or understand the spirit in life, or what we would call That's that? a whole other lecture. <laughs> uh, and, and it's you know, intense and, and complex. And, and part of the problem is, there's a whole host of words we don't have in Osage. We're thoroughgoing materialists, so we don't have a word for spirit. And when I use it, I'm just kowtowing to the colonizer in the room. <coughs> when we have ceremony, 
we summon in, uh, I'll call them Wanaki. We call in the Wanaki from uh, that Wanaki world. Uh, this is a whole other worldview, one that's uh, actually modern theoretical physicists, astrophysicists, are beginning to think like our, our ancestors thought. That there are multiple universes. We've always known that because the Wanagi come from that place. When we do ceremony in the right way, we can invite them in through a portal that we open up and we can talk to them and tell them what our needs are and they're able to help us because they have a different kind of energy than we do. Uh, so they're able to do things we can't do. At the same time, they can't help us with if we don't invite them in. In other words, they need our help as well. Uh, our world is not hierarchical, the traditional Indian world. It's not an up-down image schema, if, if I can use that language from cognitive uh, linguistics from George Lakoff and company. We have a different starting point. He thinks that's universal. And, and I think not. I, I argue that Indian people have what I call a collateral egalitarian image schema where everyone is involved in everything. That's why democracy for me has got to involve all the voices, not just a representative few who might have enough money to run for office and then work tirelessly to protect their own pecuniary interests. And so these Wenagi who come in are not above us. See, that, that gets Indians in trouble with AA when, when they sober up and try to go to AA because AA is built around, right, predicated on acknowledging a higher power. Uh-uh. Not for us. The only higher power is the colonizer. Yeah, that's the only higher power. And that's force, coercion. So I'm considered a, uh, a spiritual elder. Spiritual, that's another word we don't have because <laughs> we don't have spirit. But I'm considered that kind of an elder uh, who has responsibilities for these ceremonies. But when we get people in ceremony and we invite the Wanagi in, the people know it's one-on-one. -on -one them and the, and the Wanagi. That there's no in-between, no go-between in the person who's sitting by the door in this uh, one ceremony. The Iungri. As uh, Glenn Morris says, there are no bosses in the Indian world. And those Lutheran theologians nailed me, man. But you had chiefs! Well, that's another word we didn't have in our language. Uh, we did have a Gallega. In fact, we were better than that. We had two in every village, one from each division, sky and earth. And they took turns every other day being in charge, kind of like Hillary, having Hillary on Monday and, 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 uh, and Donald on Tuesdays. So you can only do that if you have a real democracy. It doesn't work in, 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 in an autocracy or a plutocracy. So I had to work hard to move beyond what the missionaries implanted in me at that point in order to get to this point where I wrote an essay you all can 
uh, email me. I'll, uh, I'll send you a copy of it. Why I don't believe in a creator. So there is no creator holding judgment over us, saying you have to get a handle on climate change now. No, I can tell you what the elders have told me since I was little. They're going to destroy this place for human beings. We're going to be gone. And grandmother will do just fine without us. We'll have another hundred billion years to restore all the life forms that we've managed to destroy. And I'm not saying that to distract you from the struggle, the political struggle to curtail climate change. Not at all. I'm just saying we have a little different way of seeing it, which doesn't relieve us of the responsibility to fight for justice in all cases. And justice includes justice for all my relatives out there. Anybody else? Will you come back and teach us a little more? <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> no, I'll come out when I'm asked. Tell me your name. Uh, Shirley White. Shirley? I am interested in your use of the word, word Indian, which obviously is not your word either. And very, um, I've thought about Chief Seattle a lot because we used to romanticize that, that, and now I'm seeing it as just speaking from such different points of view, and the dominator just said, well, if it doesn't belong to you, then we'll just take it. Uh, I never t got to Seattle, and I should have. Uh, so let me say a couple of things. First of all, uh, on a radio station here 40 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, talk show. Uh, my mentor was asked, what did you call the people here before the Christians came? He said, human beings. I'd prefer you use Wijajiotele, but that only works for my nation. And there are still several hundred nations, over 500, still on this continent in the bound, within the boundaries of the U.S. And they all want to be called who they are. Uh, don't I prefer Native American? Why? Native's a Latin word. You all picked it up from Latin. So it's certainly a Euro-Christian word. Uh, American? Well, the origins of American are a little up in the air. We don't really know where that word comes from. Somebody gave it to uh, this Italian guy Amerigo Vespucci, but, but it's not an Italian name, huh? Not, not, before, not before Vespucci anyway. Uh, it may be actually a word people in uh, the middle of the American coast, uh, the Caribbean and, and uh, uh, the northern shoulder of South America used to talk about themselves and their land, just as we have taken to calling this Turtle Island up here. So Indian is stuck. It's what the colonialists named us. Columbus named us that. 
We were just glad he wasn't looking for turkey. Uh, but then it would be Turks, not Turkey. So, uh, and it was, after all, the American Indian Movement. Right at the time when politically correct white liberals were creating the language of Native American. So I use them both. But I'm a member of the American Indian Movement and the Elders Council of Colorado AIM. Seattle, I've got to say something about Seattle. That speech was written down by and written by a, a colonialist physician in Washington after hearing say I'll make a speech at a treaty negotiation in the 1850s. It's his best recollection of what Seat said in Duwamish, which he only heard then in some, uh, excuse my language, but half-assed translation from, from a trader who knew enough to trade, but not enough to be philosophically in tune with the Duwamish people. Uh, what did Seattle actually say that day? None of us knows. The, the, the uh, written piece is a nice enough piece, but it's a little bit of romantic for us. D did he say some of those things? Undoubtedly in some form, but we can't say this is what Seattle said. Uh, unfortunately, I wish we could. I wish we could. But he spoke Dwamish. He didn't speak English. It's like all the treaties that were negotiated across the continent by people who uh, spoke one language or the other and not much in between. Uh, you had traders doing the translating who didn't really know, you know, enough of the language to be good at it. Uh, so that's my caution on Seattle's speech. I know it's a favorite of uh, the modern ecological movement. Do we have time for one more? Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Jelena, and I want to go back to this question of land and land ownership. Um, uh, what have you seen in your work with churches and your work with different communities? What has worked well for, has, has pe have people been giving back land? And what has been successful? And where do you see, like, sort of the, sort of the opportunities of action in that? Um, <laughs> And then what is the ideal way of giving back land to avoid ownership uh, yeah. issues that are also respectful and realistic? There's no way to avoid ownership in this current uh, socioeconomic political climate. Uh, I can tell you a couple of stories of churches that have done wonderful things. Forwinds was in a building downtown for 25 years. And every now and then the Lutherans who owned the building would mutter things about reclaiming the building. And, and we would find ways of saying, nope, you can't do that. We ain't moving. And then we got a bishop uh, three years ago who agreed, no, we should just give the building, both of them, two of them, the parsonage next door, and the property to, uh, to Four Winds. Now that's tough because now we've got to take care of it. Yeah. And Four Winds doesn't have a source of income. Uh, we're, we're not very good at getting grants. You know, we, you know, People in the Indian community said, oh, 
you must have been pretty comfortable getting that little extra from running four winds. <laughs> Cost me two grand a year to run four winds. <laughs> <laughs> and Shannon knows that now. <laughs> uh, I've lost track of your fullness of your question now. Um, just what's, what's working for Oh, anybody? I know. That's one story. The Lutherans gave it back to us. And then in 2015, uh, we had a ceremony uh, where they called the liturgy... Transfer of property to Four Winds. And we had to tell them, once they got there, because we didn't realize this was going to be an issue, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, this word property is, is that's a Euro-Christian word. We don't have anything like that. And, and this for us is not about a transfer of property. It's about making new relationships. And we had a wonderful ceremony predicated on making new relationships with one another, bringing harmony and balance back into that little piece of the world. Uh, most recently, well, in 2012, I gave a talk to the United Methodists at their uh, quadrennial general conference in Tampa, Florida. And I told them they should give some land back if they really wanted to do some good. And here, the annual conference in Oregon did exactly that this uh, spring and summer and, and restored you know, some riverfront acreage to uh, the Nez Perce Nation in their former homelands. Uh, see, the, the, the property that uh, the Lutherans gave us they had offers of a couple million dollars on that property. And in these days of really hard economic times, I can imagine there were powerful forces within you know, the, the Rocky Mountain Synod that said, yeah, we should, uh, we should sell it and uh, you know, sell it and give it to the poor. <laughs> Quote somebody I've heard say something like that once. <laughs> Things didn't turn out too well for him, huh? <laughs> so yeah, I, you know, it, it is possible. It, quite possible. And of course, uh, this is on a on the Columbia River, so it's right where you know they can go back to traditional fishing in that spot. And it's like a three-acre strip, so it was really a powerful gift. Am I done, Marie? So, so, so appreciate you coming, Tink. And um, we, we heard the hope of uh, <laughs> that you'll come back. So you will certainly be invited again, just so you're prepared. <laughs> Not me. Not me. And we thank also Bill Stevens, who's not here tonight, but who, who got uh, Tink to agree to come. He cornered me into doing this, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, you've made me feel really good, uh, like I was actually saying something to people who were listening. I appreciate that. And maybe we can connect on projects down the line. We very much want that. Thank you.